Hey everybody, Daniel here from Basement Tech. Well, this is going to be a little bit different video, and I know I've said that before, but we're going to call this one something like a dissection video. Let's see what's inside this black box. The black box is in fact a, um, a battery pack. Uh, it's called a traction assist battery pack, to be formal, from a Ford Escape Hybrid. I don't know exactly what year, but um, maybe it's a little bit older. It's a little bit of an odd battery, and it was given to me with the question, hey, can you do something with this thing? I'm working through that, and for that I'm going to ask for your help in the comments uh, near the end of the video. But for now, let's just talk about what this thing is. It's odd in that it's a nickel metal hydride um, chemistry. I view that as kind of a transition chemistry, if you will, between lead acid and NICAD and today the ubiquitous lithium ion which, as most of you know, is um, way lighter and has way more capacity per pound. Being nickel metal hydride, it's, uh, the way you charge this thing um, is special, if you will. Um, there are three different ways you can do it. Super slow way with super low current, that's safe and easy. You can watch the delta T and terminate based on um, the temperature starting to go up, or you can watch delta V. Um, that makes it a little hard to charge, so it's not the kind of thing you can just hook to your solar charge controller and um, have a really nifty wall battery thing like the um, Tesla battery pack. Nickel metal hydride was used in some of the original uh, electric cars like the Toyota Prius. Uh, again, sorry, that's a, um, a hybrid, but in some of the early hybrids and... Um, I believe in the Nissan Leaf, but on that, I'm not sure. If you know, maybe comment in the, um, the comments below. Um, so it's a unique chemistry. It's a wonderful form factor. And as we dig into this thing, you're going to see it's built just extremely well. Its form factor allows it to be super easily mounted to a wall or something. It's thin and flat and... Um, it is heavy, but it's got some wonderful mounting holes, and I think the mechanical engineering is kind of startlingly amazing, and I think you'll see as you get into it, that's the fact. Anyway, um, here I'm strategizing with my buddy Kevin, who came because he was as curious as I was about what's inside this thing. We're strategizing, trying to figure out the best way to get into it and whether we can do something with it. With all that said, let's dig in. Look, there's um, another set on the bottom. Oh, there is, yeah. The, um, I'm still debating whether I think any of this is worth it. But... Well, if nothing else, you get some things you can sell out of it. Um, it depends on whether you want to, you know, try to build a nickel metal hydride battery or not. Why not just the bottom ones hold the bottom piece, but it prevents the top piece from coming off, right? Yeah, if you've got screw, if you've got threads in there, it's gonna prevent that from. Stop and start a couple times so that, um, that program doesn't make it easy to grab something out of the middle. As the final screw comes out, we begin to strategize about how we are going to manipulate this thing and keep our spinal integrity intact. Also, we begin to notice some things about the pack that give us an idea of how it's internally constructed. You can see those long columns or tubes, and they're about the size, uh, the diameter of a D-sized battery. So we begin to suspect this whole thing is made up of that size individual cells linked together. Originally, we thought there was another set of screws on the bottom. As we lift it up, however, Kevin notices it's starting to come apart, which is a good thing. 
Then we notice further that it's actually two identical symmetrical battery packs um, mechanically connected together. There's a double set of cable harnesses, uh, identical, again, symmetrical. And I think that probably leads to some pretty good um, reliability and um, ease of construction, if you will, just given the weight. Given the weight, we move that table into place so we have something to receive half of it, again, which is a lot of pounds in, in and of itself. Back to chemistry. Uh, this is nickel metal hydride. And if they are D-cells, I think that means they're about 1.2 or so volts per cell. And um, those individual tubes that are like half of the width of the whole battery pack will hold five. So you put 10 of the such cells together and you get about 12 volts per column. You link all of those 12 volts in series and you get up to about 180. In fact, our suspicions are revealed as this thing opens up. Our suspicions are revealed that, yep, it really is heavy, and we're trying to manipulate one half of it onto that table, and that it's made up of these individual packs, if you will, um, of uh, five each of those D-size um, nickel metal hydride uh, batteries. Um, as we continue to clip um, uh, cable connectors and such apart so that we can work on one half of the battery at a time, it's a good time to notice, uh, to provide a few more details about this battery pack. Again, this is a traction battery pack. It's used not to drive long distances, but just to assist in the acceleration and deceleration, some of the most inefficient parts of uh, driving to boost um, uh, mileage, to boost uh, uh, mileage per gallon, if you will, uh, incrementally, but it does boost it. Um, also, these packs were used in some of the earliest hybrids not these exact packs, but this chemistry, nickel metal hydride, which used in some of the original packs, um, like in the Toyota Prius, for example. Um, nickel metal hydride is a robust um, chemistry in that it uh, has a wide uh, temperature range, um, which is really good for battery packs in general, and uh, could make it a fun battery pack to use if you didn't want to have to worry about it uh, getting too cold. All right, the requisite flyby, if you will. Um, in the end, we're going to end up following all of the cables. Um, but here, I just wanted you to, again, marvel like we did at the mechanical construction of this thing. Um, the plastic um, injection molded uh, piece is uh, super cleverly designed to provide uh, support for this thing, again, which is heavy. And um, all of the vulnerable connections are uh, very well covered with uh, a membrane where it's necessary. There are two such covered areas that really piqued our curiosity, A, in that they were covered and we need to see everything, and B, in that that's where the wires went. So we're going to dig into this middle section um, first. Given things that you need to do while um, controlling a battery pack, uh, it's suspected that the middle area contains um, connections that would allow balancing and or moder um, and or monitoring uh, individual parts of the battery. Um, it's not too hard to balance um, nickel metal hydride batteries. That's one of the charging methods wherein if you just charge it super slow, like hundreds of milliamps, and run it through every one of these batteries in series, you'll end up with a balance pack in, in the end. Um, however, that takes a long time and that might not be a good thing. Uh, as batteries get out of, ba out of balance, uh, heating will be uh, out of balance and could lead to hot spots that may not be good uh, for the battery in general. As we suspected, yeah, and um, that middle section just provides a, ho a whole bunch of wires that connect to individual sets of these cells. Again, since there are two symmetrical um, halves to this thing and two symmetrical wire harnesses, it's a lot of connections for monitoring uh, balancing, monitoring and or active balancing. All of this is speculation because I don't have the, the BMS, if you will, that uh, was controlling the thing, just the, the cells. Um, 
You can see lots and lots of speculation going on here and uh, trying to understand what each of these individual connections, how much of the battery pack it would monitor. That led us to this super curious one uh, that Kevin's holding uh, right here. It's one individual conductor that has a silicon rubber and, you know, you're all shouting high voltage. Yep. A silicon rubber high voltage insulation. Um, and there are only two of them. This is one place where it's not symmetrical, one on each battery pack. So if you match the two pieces and we traced it all out, it looks like um, it's used to monitor the sum of all of the cells. In other words, what is the motor seeing? Um, what is the motor controller seeing in terms of an input voltage? So that's in fact what it was. What we found super curious and maybe a little weird is that that single conductor went into a like a six or eight pin connector and only used one of the pins um, maybe they buy them in bulk I'm not really sure um, we'll continue to dig in and the next target of course is are, are those two um, PCB uh, uh, connector uh, PCBs uh, on the left and right there aren't any active components on there. They just connect one thing to the other. Well, let's see what that one thing and the other are as we continue uh, to dig in. All right, well, we're really starting to reach the inner chambers of this cave system. I think maybe two more covers to remove and all will be revealed. It's a couple of intriguing ones. Um, this one on the end, I think, is of particular importance just to understand how uh, these battery, big battery packs work in general. Um, you might be asking yourself, Dan, you said those individual little cells are 1.2 volts and each row is only 12 volts. How the heck do you get up anywhere near 180 volts? Well, it's just basically the concept of a series connection. If you connect two voltage sources, like two batteries in series, in other words, plus to minus, plus to minus, you get to add the voltages together. Now, you don't add the currents that's connecting in parallel is a different thing, but you get to add the voltages. And if you do that enough times, you, um, you get up to some pretty high voltage. There are a lot of cells here, and a lot of 1.2s uh, adds up to 180. And as this this um, small cover and the next big cover are removed, you'll really get an idea of how that's done in this pack. You've all done this with your old uh, flashlights that took big D-cell batteries. As you stick them in the end of the tube, you know, the plus connects to the minus, the plus connects to the minus, and those one and a half volt um, batteries that, you know, you use for your flashlight add up to a voltage that's significant enough to give you a super bright light when connected to the light bulb. In this case, what's contained um, at the end of these battery packs are little bus bars that connect um, these um, rows of batteries end to end. Each individual cell that makes up the row is connected end to end, plus to minus, plus to minus, and each row is connected to each other, plus to minus, plus to minus. Again, when I pull that last cover off you'll really get a vision of the bus bar but here we just want to see um, what kind of voltages we can measure now it's going to be a little odd because these battery packs this battery pack is not fully charged each six volt um, each six volt uh, half of one column is only at about five volts and that's just to the state of charge of the battery but as we start to measure different parts, you see multiples of that five volts um, uh, come come to uh, to life. So if we put four of them together, you end up at about 19 volts. The whole pack end to end is 119 volts. So we've been careful all along not to touch those two ends uh, simultaneously. Just like sticking your finger in a light socket, it would be quite a jolt. So that is the same. Um, 20 volts. One uh, final thing to reveal, and that's uh, temperature sensors. Um, I mentioned one way of knowing when you're done charging a nickel metal hydride battery is to watch for the temperature, the delta T, the rise in temperature over time to change. 
um, easy to do with a computer. Um, so we're we were very happy to see when we opened this thing up, little modules, if you will, that look like temperature sensors, and there's a lot of them, like 20 per half. And all of those individual um, temperature Positive sensors, okay. if they are in fact temperature sensors, so when they're um, together, make their way out to one of these multi-pin connectors voltage. that would have made its way what back to the battery management uh, system. Up, a little bit more on that when we reveal one of those. What I'm noting one here middle, is that is the these are the high voltage pack. connections this out of each half of the pack. Um, the two ends that are taped up were the original two electrodes that would have come out of the pack. The two orange ones in the middle that connect the two halves of the pack together were connected via a mechanical um, like bus bar that was jammed in there um, and could be removed uh, electromechanically, uh, presumably by the controller or the car, if it saw that there was a fault. All right, finally, the temperature I sensor. Guess what that is. Um, it's just we pulled one of these thermistor. out, and again, the clever mechanical design continues. Um, it was pushed into a, a crevice between battery packs such that it made great contact, padded underneath so that it made As great said, contact. That, that would give a really accurate measurement of the, uh, the temperature of the battery pack itself. I'm hoping these sensors are sort of uh, conventional and we're about to confirm that, in fact, they are probably um, standard thermistors. Now, standard thermistors are 10K at uh, room temperature. Look at that, 10K. Kevin grabbed a hold of the sensor, and you saw that it responded extremely quickly to the, to, um, the temperature of his fingers, which is, again, um, indicative of a temperature sensor that might be used for measuring delta T to know when the state of charge is uh, at full. So that was a, a, a really cool um, revelation that, uh, about the temperature sensor and the fact that we might be able to use that for something going forward, given that it is a standard temperature sensor. All right, there you have it, the final reveal. And those bus bars are very obvious in... Um, in this panning uh, view and you can see again as I mentioned just n to n plus to minus plus to minus is the concept and that adds up to uh, 120 at the current state of charge and more like 140 or 50 at the um, full state of charge you can see things also move along quickly as we get toward the end of our um, discoveries and here I thought it would just be fun to charge up one set of um, of batteries, like in other words, two of these rows, and uh, that makes up about a, a 24 volt um, pack, so if you will, to and um, it's charging up as expected. So I expect this to be a long charge. Yeah, right. Well, as we reach the end of our discoveries, this is the part in the video where I do want to ask for your help. I'm having a hard time deciding if it's worth pursuing this pack as maybe a power wall type thing in a either a solar or just battery backup system. I have yet to find any off-the-shelf components that would contribute to such a system. In other words, off-the-shelf components that know what nickel metal hydride is. Those individual cells, each row of 12 volts, uh, could very conveniently be connected to create a 12 volt, a 24 volt, or a 48 volt nickel metal hydride pack. However, again, um, in a solar system, for example, I have yet to find an off-the-shelf a solar charge controller that understands nickel metal hydride. Well, if you have experience in these matters and or uh, opinions on whether I should pursue this, um, I would very much appreciate your input in the comments. Also, if you found off the shelf things that I've missed that might contribute to a really cool uh, battery backup or solar charge control system, let me know about those in the comments below. Really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy this kind of video, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up. If you really, really like it, please subscribe, and we'll talk to you next time.